Hey YouTubers, it's me again, Lonnie Clark. I'm going to read from our article. It's called, uh, you know, it's the Oral History of John Goffman, conducted December 20th, 1994, published June 1995, on uh, Oral History, Human Radiation Studies, Remembering the Early Years, Oral History of Dr. John W. Goffman, MD, PhD. So we're building the background. He's being interviewed. So here we are. To University of California, Berkeley to study physical chemistry. Goffman. So I went down and talked to Professor Steiner, whom I had worked for in a job at Oberlein for three years. He said there is only one place in the world for the kind of chemistry you'd like to study, which was physical chemistry. And that's Berkeley. There is no other place. It turned out, just in a quirk, that in the two years before, Oberlein had sent two graduating men in a row to Berkeley for chemistry. The college had never sent any before, and none before them had ever applied for admittance. Both of them were doing well at Berkeley. He said... <clears throat> Maybe with, the rec with that record, you can get a teaching assistantship there. I applied, and I did get a teaching assistantship. In August 1940, I, I came to Berkeley to, to be a graduate student in chemistry. Norman Herr, H-O-E-R-R, -R, had assured me I don't care what anyone tells you. If you want to come back to med school after you finish, finish chemistry, I'll guarantee that you'll be coming back here to Western Reserve. What I had was essentially a leave of absence based on this one man's assurance that I could get back in. The dean was not too sympathetic, as I said. I came out to Berkeley. The dean of the College of Chemistry at Berkeley at that time was Gilbert Newton Lewis, <coughs> one of the nine time greats in chemistry. There were many, many famous things that he did. In fact, he was the father of chemical thermodynamics. The book that he wrote with Ra Merrill Randall, commonly called Lewis and Randall, was the Bible of thermodynamics worldwide for several decades. Kenneth Pitzer, who later went to who later who later went to head physics at AEC, revised the book. Wow. At any rate, I introduced myself to Mabel Kettridge, who was the secretary with the department, and she said, You can get to see the Dean. She gave me an appointment and I went to go see Gilbert Newton Lewis. He said, some of the graduate students should take a course or two, but they don't bother much with courses. Get your research started within the next few weeks. Huh. Assisting Seaborg's research. Seaborg. Assisting Seaborg's research. Discovery of Uranium-233. Goffman. I was terrified. Get your research started. I didn't think I knew anything to get started in research. I figured you'd take courses for at least a year or two. The system at Berkeley, I don't think it's different now, was that you went around as a graduate student to see professors to see if they had something they wanted to they wanted a new student to work on with them. I finally narrowed it down to seeing William Francis Gioke, G I A U Q U E, Gioke. Low temperature thermodynamics. It looked like it was interesting work. The other choice was with this young guy who was an assistant professor, I think at the time, Glenn Seaborg. Oh, there's that name. That's Gorley. Goffman. So, I chose to work with Glenn Seaborg. I did get started with my research within a couple of weeks. Hmm. Okay, I'm sorry, you guys. I was going back and reading again. 
Gorley, what specific research were you working on with Glenn Seaborg? The specific research was the one hole in the series of radioactive nuclides. That was called the N4 plus 1. If you divide the atomic mass number by 4, they had they had radionuclide members with zero things added and things with two, three, and four added, but no 4n plus 1. Seaborg said maybe we can find out why this is missing. That was the year after fission was discovered. Before the discovery of fission, somebody had thought they had seen Protactinium-233, which was in the N4 plus 1 series. When fission was discovered, they no longer knew whether they had a proactinium or didn't, because there was a zirconium nuclide that would have the same chemical pro properties as pro protactinium. They weren't sure anymore whether protactinium existed in this one series they had thought they made before the discovery of fission. The first start of the week was to bombard thorium with neutrons that made thorium-233 from thorium-232. It was very short-lived for an isotope. 23 minutes half-life, decaying by beta emissions to protactinium. This radioactivity had a 27-day half-life and the properties either of zirconium or protactinium. Very little was known about the chemistry of element 91, which is protactinium at that time, except it was known that it did have some chemical properties similar to zirconium. I remember I had gotten as far as Christmas Day in 1940 where I was able to crystallize zirconium oxychloride in a concentrated hydrochloric acid, showing that the, react showing that the radioactivity did not go with the zirconium but was left over after I crystallized away the zirconium. Therefore, it was protactinium-233. We published this finding in Physical Review with Seaborg, me, and Joe Kennedy. Do you know Joe Kennedy? Gorley, no. Goffman. Joe Kennedy was one of the most brilliant chemists I've ever met. He was working with Seaborg. He was the guy who did all the equipment manufacture for our group. There were no scaling circuits, there were no counters, no nothing. Joe built them. And in fact, some commercial companies grew out of some of the things he developed. He was a chemist with golden hands and very brilliant. Ernest Lawrence knew it. And so when things went a little further, Joe split away from the group because Ernest needed him to work on the uranium, on the 234 uranium and the 235 uranium separation of the electromagnetic method for the war, the bomb. Gorley, right. Goffman. Then a little later, Joe was tapped by J. Robert Oppenheimer to be the chief chemist at the Los Alamos lab. But in the early days, Joe helped us get started. Excuse me, but in the early days, Joe helped us started. That's what it says, started. I think get started is what they meant. The next step, since protactinium decayed by the beta emission, that was there, there had to be uranium-233 because that's what you get from the protactinium decay, one unit higher on the periodic table. The idea was to look for uranium-233. By then, we knew about fission. There was talk about po the possible bomb. So the question was, what kind of properties would 233 uranium have? 
We didn't know whether it would have a half-life of five days or a hundred thousand years. I started to look for the alpha particles growing out of the protactinium samples. It was just marginal that there was some alpha emissions growing out with a very long half-life. It was so marginal, we couldn't be sure. We knew we needed a much larger bombardment of thorium to try to make more. Summertime came. School was over in May. At that time, it started in August. I think it's back to that system now. So we had no support, no monetary support. It was just little support. Corley. This was at Berkeley with Seaborg Goffman. Yes, and I said, sure, I would stay for the summer. However, I got married before I came out to California. And with the teaching assistantship and $65 a month, it was possible to live. But there was nothing, no income for the summer. Seaborg tried to get me a $150 stipend for the summer, which wasn't available. I did have six weeks that were taken care of because I had a lab assistant in physical chemistry, because I was a lab assistant in physical chemistry. <coughs> but then the last six weeks of summer, there was no support at all. So I went back to Ohio to live with our families. Seaborg has written up that in some memoirs of his own. I can't remember which of the books. I couldn't get $150 for somebody who worked. He couldn't get $150 for somebody who worked on a program which eventually got labeled a $50 quadrillion discovery. I came back in the fall and all kinds of things were different. By then the Office of Science, Scientific Research and Development was getting more serious and we had money. Gorley, where did this money come from? Goffman, from the government and the Office of Scientific Research and Development. That was before the Manhattan Project. Gorley, okay. Goffman, Seaborg even got some money to hire Ray Stoughton, who had just gotten his Ph.D. a couple of years before at Berkeley to help me with the work. To make a very long story short, work went fine because Seaborg was convinced the work was important. They even managed to get me absolved of the teaching duties of being a graduate student assistant at the freshman chemistry class which I had to do two weekends, oh, two afternoons a week. Then I had a very good break. I only had to read papers for Professor Giso, Gioke, who was the other person I wanted to work for. I had taken his course the year before. I really got to understand it the next year when I was a teaching assistant, and I had to read the problem sets on the exams. He was a great man. The work went fine. We did a big bombardment of thorium, let the protactinium decay, and finally concentrated the material down. We put it all on a plate and watched the alpha particles grow out and, show, and showed we had uranium-233 with a half-life of about 150,000 years. Gorley. Now, how dangerous is that? Goffman. Uranium-233 in the amount we had? We had four millionth of a gram. Not very dangerous. Gorley. Okay. Wow. Oh, this is the Manhattan Project. I'm going to stop there at the Manhattan Project because... One, two, one, six. I'm going to date this. Well, you guys, I apologize for my dodgy reading. Uh, hopefully, I'll be getting better, but I tend to not be. I put this off until too late, and I end up being a little bit tired. Uh, hopefully, tomorrow I'll have some time to do it before it's too late. Put your courage feet on. Take some action. Ciao, you guys.